So I want to take you now to a surprising turn around this mountain. Okay, everybody ready for this ascent? So if you were actually paying attention to the subliminal implications of what I'm presenting, you're screwed. Because I just told you that shit happens to you in your childhood, leaves you with feelings of inadequacy, and then you spend the rest of your life spinning wheels trying to compensate for those inadequacies. I lost 48 years trying to be smart, earning the equivalent of four master's degrees, a PhD, writing those papers, and at the end of it, what did it bring me? Just as much insecurity as I had at the beginning of that ascent. So what am I telling you, folks? I'm telling you that shit happens to you in your childhood. You try to compensate for it, but no matter how hard you compensate for it, you still feel shitty because that inadequacy never goes away. Now, folks, try to follow the choice of words and catch me in the act if you can. I'm telling you, I, somebody called me mentally retarded, so I started busting my ass, earning four master's degrees, trying to be smart. If I tell you that I am trying to be smart, read between the lines, what am I implying that I'm not? Would you agree? If I tell you I'm trying to be smart, it means I have already made a decision that I'm not smart. How many of you are with me in this fundamental logic? Very important. And that is why once I've decided I'm not smart, no matter how hard I try to compensate for my lack of smartness, I will be confronted with my inadequacy because I've already decided I'm not smart. And that's why I'm trying to be smart. But if I've decided I'm not smart, no amount of external assurance from the outside world is going to convince me that I'm smart. Because the very reason I'm trying to be smart is because I've decided I'm not smart. How many of you have really digested this conundrum? Right. Now, is there a way out? Yes, says Osho. And Osho gives you a miraculous escape route. Ready? Okay. So before that, I have to tell you, uh, take you through another little uh, slight segue. Folks, I'm 55 years old. I'm teaching you all this, right? Do you think I practice any of this highfalutin shit? No. If you look at the state of my life, it's a hot mess. Okay? I don't practice any of the wisdom that I bring to you. Because in the East, we have a very clear distinction. There are masters and there are teachers. Masters are people who have experientially attained to certain high states of consciousness and functioning. Osho is an example of a master. I am a teacher. My job is I don't have to practice any of this. I have a great excitement for sharing and communicating. So I say, I read Osho and I've heard and I communicate. So don't hold me to the standard of practicing anything, okay? Right. So here's the thing I want you to understand. I am doing these seminars. 20,000 people have come to these seminars. I've been on a national seminar tour. One of the great management experts who represents the national program manager for the organization that took me on the seminar tour, these were the people who sponsored the biggest names in management like Peter Drucker, Stephen Covey, Michael Porter. He's gone on record to say that Param, by the ratings that he's received nationally, I would place him on par with the seven greatest management thinkers and he occupies a secure place among the greatest management educators in the world. Would you agree I'm unique, special, and extraordinary? But I'm not going to feel that way. Because if I'm trying so hard to be unique, special, and extraordinary, look at how I deviously am giving you my whole resume over the course of these four and a half hours. Because I lack a sense of self-appreciation or self-worth. Deep down, I'm so insecure. I don't even have the faith that the quality of this seminar will speak for itself. I have to tell you a four master's degree and a PhD. And I have to tell you 20,000 people have come and listened to the seminar. So if you don't like it, too bad. There will be something wrong with you. <laughs> 20,000 other people liked it. Okay? And then, not only that, I'm one of the eight greatest management educators. Look at the level of insecurity. I'm a bragger. Any little thing I do, I send out a mass email to the entire school of business titled, Kudos to Param. <laughs> right? Now, I want you to understand, if I'm trying so hard to be unique, special, and extraordinary in your eyes, what would you agree that I have decided I'm not unique, special, and extraordinary? So no matter how much I bust my hairy Indian ass trying to be unique, special, and extraordinary, I'm doomed. I will never feel unique, special, and extraordinary. 
Now, folks, ready for the ascent? The aircraft's going to take off. Fasten your seatbelts. Now I'm going to take you, put a series of questions to you, and I need you to participate with the fullness of your heart and with the fullness of your being. And raise your hand if you agree with me. So the first thing I want you to do is get real with one another. You're all in different relationships. Some of you have significant others, spouses, insignificant others. <laughs> now, how do you see it to look at two people and say, oh, that's a significant other, or oh, that looks like an insignificant other? Okay, you have all of these. You have, you have bosses, you have professors, you have different people, your parents you're trying to impress. Each one of us has different constituencies that we are trying to be unique, special, and extraordinary in the eyes of. How many of you would agree that if you were to uh, uh, survey the constellation of all your relationships, there's at least one or two relationships in which you're trying to show up as unique, special, and extraordinary? Raise your hand. Almost every one of us is, right? And what did we just learn? If you're trying to be unique, special, and extraordinary, there's no hope for you. You're doomed. But there is hope for you, says Osho. Through a transcendental pathway, so everybody get ready for the breakthrough. I want you to look around at all the people in this room, turn around, and I want you to see if you can find one person who's exactly like you. If you're willing to concede that there isn't one person exactly like you in this room, please raise your hand, no excuses. There is not one person exactly like you in this room, excellent. If we were to look in the whole building, how many of you would agree that there isn't one person exactly like you in the whole building? Raise your hand. Okay, keep going. If you were to look all over Northeast Ohio, how many of you would agree there isn't one person exactly like you in Northeast Ohio? How many of you would agree that if you went to all the 50 states of the United States of America, you probably would not find one person exactly like you in all the 50 states of the United States of America? Raise your hand. So far, so good. If you went to all the countries of the world, how many of you would agree that it's quite possible there isn't one person exactly like you, in, even if you search the, in all the countries of the world? Now, if you expanded your dragnet further and you pulled out people from submarines and took a look at them and you searched every aircraft, every conceivable place on the planet, how many of you would agree that there probably isn't one person exactly like you on the whole planet? Raise your hand. And please don't drop your hand. Raise it further and keep it raised. You know what you're saying yes to? I just asked you, are you unique, special, and extraordinary? And you have just raised your hand. Because the very definition of unique, special, and extraordinary is that there isn't one person like you on the whole goddamn planet. And you voted yes. Which means that you are unique, special, and extraordinary. Wow, that is a very fundamental place that Osho takes you to. Because we have been programmed to believe that unique, special, and extraordinary is an accomplishment. You have to achieve it. And the Eastern mystics like Osho say, no, it's an awakening. You have to awaken to it. The universe has created you unique, special, and extraordinary. You are sleepwalking through life in a highly drugged state. You're not even aware. You're busting your ass, running in a 50 different directions, trying to prove that you're unique, special, and extraordinary. And the cosmic joke is that you are that. When you really let this seep in, you'll burst out laughing because the whole life is ridiculous. 50, 60 years trying to be unique, special, and extraordinary. And the joke is that you were created unique, special, and extraordinary. Even when you were born, there was no baby like you on the whole planet. And you were unique, special, and extraordinary, and you forgot. So that is an awakening. Now, that's the beginning of a process of awakening. Now, here, notice, folks, there are two different models to human growth, personal growth. In the Western model is that capabilities and strengths and all these beautiful things are things you have to cultivate and grow within you. In the Eastern model, the most beautiful things about you are already hidden in you. But like an uncut diamond, you don't see it. Because a diamond could be buried in the mud. All you need to do is to extract, extricate the diamond, dust off all the mud, and allow it to glow. In other words, who you are created is unique, special, and extraordinary. You just forgot. And once you can start noticing that, there's a revolution in your inner consciousness. Fall in love with yourself. 
How many of you would agree that on a day-to-day -day basis in our mundane lives, we don't regard ourselves with the appreciation and of how we are unique, special, and extraordinary? We are not walking around thinking, oh my goodness, I'm so cool. <laughs> there is nobody like me on this whole planet. Now, as a corollary, now you might think that leads to narcissism. It leads to the opposite. Because all of a sudden, I'll say, Judy here is also unique, special, and extraordinary. There's nobody like this in the whole planet. Every one of you is unique, special, and extraordinary. So where will I feel any sense of superiority? Each one of us is unique, special, and extraordinary. And each one is like a unique flower. And all of a sudden, there's a revolution of co inner consciousness. Then you know that somebody who uh, is the grocery store bags your groceries. There is no other human being like them on the whole planet. You will look, there, look at them through eyes of sacredness. You will have the eyes to see the sacred and the most mundane. You will see light, a real race of light where there is darkness because you will recognize every being is. And then, of course, if you follow the Eastern mystics, they will say the same thing applies to the cow and the cat. You wouldn't want to reduce this cow to a filling between two sides of a sandwich that would be sacrilegious because there's no cow like this in the whole planet it's the only one of its kind that's how hindus regard cows as sacred okay or any animal as sacred every being is sacred not just beings then you start thinking of pebbles and leaves how many of you would agree no two leaves in the planet are exactly alike every leaf is different Every pebble is different. Then comes another quantum leap into a state of consciousness that Osho takes you to. As you climb the summit, he reminds you, do you recognize that every moment in time will never be repeated? That every moment in time, this moment, this moment, this moment is unique, special, and extraordinary. Breathe in. Every breath is unique, special, and extraordinary. When I breathe in, that breath will never happen again in the entire future, present, or history of humanity. So then you become awakened. You say every moment is unique, special, and extraordinary. So different from our regular insanity, says Osho, where you spend half your time, life, saving time. How many of you try save, saving time? And then you spend the other half of your life killing time. <laughs> Right? And that to Osho is the unenlightened consciousness. The enlightened consciousness is when you say every moment is unique, special and extraordinary and then there is never a boring moment in your life. Because this is so beautiful, this moment will never come. And you st How many of you would agree that that's not the level of awakened, caffeinated consciousness with which we go about celebrating every moment in our lives? You will never have a boring moment. And I'm going to take this to a weird place. It is not just the beautiful things that are unique, special, and extraordinary. It's not just the roses that are unique, special, and extraordinary, the fragrance and the flower. Because, you know, a rose is really releasing its fragrance, not in a competitive mindset. My, the rose in your backyard doesn't say, I want to be the most fragrant rose. I want to kick every other rose on its ass. <laughs> no, it just releases its fragrance. And it's non-discriminating. Mahatma Gandhi can walk by it, the rose releases its fragrance. Jeffrey Dahmer can come from the other side, it'll release its fragrance. This is the only example where Jeffrey Dahmer and Mahatma Gandhi have been brought together in the same conceptual space. Right? It is. And then you start enjoying the fragrance of every moment. You inhale every moment. You dance in celebration and joy. And that is an awakened consciousness. Then you realize it's not just the beautiful things. Every thorn is also unique, special, and extraordinary. Right? Which also means every mosquito bite is also unique, special, and extraordinary. Which also means that the cockroach in your kitchen cupboard, there's no other cockroach like that in the whole world. <laughs> or a spider, go let it out, let it enjoy its life. Maybe it's a being on the path to a new state of enlightened consciousness. Who are you to interfere with its destiny? A deep respect for life arises. But then you begin to recognize, as I have, folks, I want you to know that for all this big talking, I'm pretty seriously fucked up. <laughs> I've gone bankrupt in my life. My house has gone to foreclosure. I've been through three divorces, or 2.99 divorces, actually. <laughs> the other one is just awaiting a final signature <laughs> and a trip to, the, uh, to Lakeside Avenue, which will probably happen on Tuesday. Because, you know, whenever I've been, 
When, when I'm married, actually, I live in a very precarious state of matrimony. It's like the weather report. Any day I've been married through the last 10 years in my marriage, it was like, there's a 60% chance of thunderstorms. Like, there's a 60% chance this marriage will survive to the next day. There's a 20% chance there'll be snow, there'll be a divorce. So it was always a probabilistic thing. Even now, it's a 99% chance that we will sign the court papers and they will be filed on Tuesday. Okay, so um, jokes aside, uh, coming back to where I had left off, so I am a pretty fucked up guy, but I truly have come to relish the ways in which I'm fucked up. Because when you begin to awaken to the uniqueness and splendor and grandeur and magnificence of every moment and recognize there's no other like this, I know that I'm fucked up in such a unique way that none of you are <laughs> fucked up exactly the same way. So then you start celebrating your dysfunctionality saying, you know what, I'm fucked up, but I'm the only one fucked up in this entire planet in this way. And then all of a sudden you've transcended the duality of self-hate and self-love. Because something that you consider a dysfunctional part of you can now glow. Glow with a luminousness, right? Which is really uplifting. And then all the self-hate disappears and a transmutation of that hate into love happens. And then all of a sudden, you start embracing even the horrible tragedies that happen in your life because it's unique. It'll never happen again, right? And all of a sudden, you start embracing everything as unique, special, and extraordinary. And that joyousness and that state of bliss, and Osho talks about it as beyond happiness and unhappiness. We have too many people peddling happiness and unhappiness. Because you're caught in the duality, you're unhappy, and then some happiness guru comes and tells you, if you read my book and attend my talks and you pay me this, I will make you happy. No, happiness and unhappiness are sides of the two same coin. Anything that you call happiness is often dependent on something outside. You transcend this dichotomy to a level of a state of being which is called bliss. It's neither happiness or unhappiness. It comes from engaging in the kind of deep inner work that we are talking about in this seminar. Looking at all the things that have happened to you, embracing and celebrating yourself for who you are and for who you are not. That is rising about the duality. And it's called unsolved tears. I want to throw in two more concepts before we march further. And uh, uh, where is my slide? Scarcity creates compensatory striving in childhood to become the opposite of whatever you felt you were lacking and therefore you decide you must show them. So folks, Osho says our childhoods take two forms. For example, some of us go to our parents and we want appreciation. We try to cater to them and you succeed. So they pat you on your back and say, good boy, good girl. You're screwed because for the rest of the life, you will become a very obedient person and a people pleaser. You live everybody else's expectations of you, but perhaps not your own. Sometimes you go, I, I see people are pointing to people next to them. And I appreciate that stroke of insight, but I'm waiting for somebody to go this way. It's very easy to go this way. I want to see this now in the seminar. Okay, so now um, uh, are people pl please are right. Or like me, you try to please, you try to impress your parents and they don't pay any attention. Then what do you say? You say, I'll show these bastards. And then you become a college professor. <laughs> you didn't listen to me, but now so many people listen to me. So often, based on your real or imaginary inadequacy, you start out trying to be, fill in the blanks for yourself. In my life, it was lacking in smartness, trying to be smart. If you're trying to be smart, it means that you have already decided that you're not. Therefore, no amount of external assurance can make you feel smart because you've already decided that you're not smart and you're stuck there. And the pathway is transcending the conundrum. Remember these questions? Is there anybody in this room exactly like you? And we keep escalate, uh, raising the ante. Is there anybody on the planet exactly like you? No. Isn't that the very definition of unique, special, and extraordinary? Who you are is already that unique, special, and extraordinary. Folks, how many of you would agree that this is not a popularly inhabited perspective in the world? And I want you to take it upon yourself from having been in this seminar, uh, spreading this perspective, helping people love and accept themselves for who they are, just the way they are, with no conditions. 
we will create a very loving world. Osho, in fact, believes that if children start loving themselves for who they are unconditionally and celebrating themselves and we all start loving and accepting ourselves, greed will disappear. Hate will disappear. Wars will disappear. All of those things will disappear. It all starts with that fundamental relationship with ourselves that is broken. And then we put band-aid and we do try to treat that. No, confront that self-hate, love yourself and rejoice for who you are and who you're not. And that's the transcending the conundrum. I want to take you to, so it's almost like, how many of you had an experience where there are knots in your being and somebody has to massage those knots and release them? This is almost like do this to your own being. Get to those knots in your being, knots of sadness, knots of unsolved tears that continue to exact a heavy psychic cost. Uh, so I want you to do this in your home. Involve everybody. Get together with your friends and family. It'll be a great party, I can assure you. Think about three defining crucible moments in your life and how these experiences shaped your being. What are some masks that you place that hides your original face? Folks, I have been doing versions of these programs for organizations. I've been at an organization where they called me for team building and instead of doing some simple team building exercises, I engaged them for three-fourths of the day on people sharing their emotional histories, the stuff that has happened to them and the masks that they wear every day to work. In fact, in one of the workshops I'm doing, people will be creating masks. So as a team, we will stand around in a circle and we will wear masks and show each other what masks we are wearing. How many of you can tell that if you are actually dialoguing and relating to each other at that level of depth in terms of the fundamental emotional histories that we bring to work, our workplaces will become very different? I can tell you after that session, the director of the division called me and said, I don't know what the hell you did with these people. This was a department on non-speaking terms and now they seem to love each other so much. It was simple. Most of us feel strongly judgmental towards others because we don't really look at what they have gone through. Folks, how many of you have been in meetings where there's one obnoxious guy who wants to show that he's smart and knowledgeable and he dominates the meeting and if he just kept his mouth shut, the meeting would be a lot better? That was me. <laughs> trying to be smart, trying to impress people and people would be waiting like, if only he would shut up, we'd get something done. They still say that, but for entirely different reasons, you know. But so, that, so understand, some people are trying to be smart. If you really look at any of these traits that are accentuated and exaggerated out of proportion to the point that they're really a compensatory activity, you will know that they have probably suffered deeply in their childhood. From that place of compassion, imagine if we make possible those conversations at the workplace. I believe we have made a fundamental error in management, and here I am to fix it. No, uh, but, but here's what it is. The error is this. We have built organizations based on the fall premise that all the crap that has happened to you in your childhood is between you and your shrink. Go deal with it at the Cleveland Clinic. Don't bring it to the workplace. When you are here at the workplace, you have a job description and we want you to fulfill this job description. But folks, that's a myth. How many of you would agree that Things that have happened to you at the workplace have affected your peace of mind in the family. And how many of you would agree that the crap that has happened in your domestic life has also carried over to work? So why pretend that it doesn't happen that way? So I'm bringing forward a genre of seminars which are normally unheard of in management training where deeply personal issues and emotional histories are actually brought within the legitimate space of organizational explorations and conversations. Hi, Keisha. I want to share with you, this kind of work is not new. In the company that I used to work for, Unilever, um, there's a man called Phil Mervis who wrote a book called From the Desert and Back. There were entire divisions of Unilever where the top all the way to the bottom, people would share their emotional histories. And the levels of closeness, intimacy is just amazing. 